I want to take a, a quick diversion that's not really a diversion to, to dig into this a bit, because you kind of hinted that the atrophying shipbuilding capability and the loss of shipyards in the U.S. was possibly tied to China. Yeah, I mean, th- this is a larger issue with the U.S. maritime industry. So the, the U.S. maritime industry started off after World War II, we were the predominant merchant fleet in the world. And you know, we've long had capability, we've long had legislation um, to try and protect the domestic shipbuilding industry from unfair foreign competition. Unfortunately, what has happened starting in the 80s and then moving on uh, to the present day is first Japan, then South Korea, and now China um, massively subsidize their state uh, backed shipbuilding enterprises. And they, they provide uh, certainly not a level playing field, and they provide uh, the type of economic and financial support to national champion shipbuilders um, that the United States stopped doing during the Reagan administration. And so we have these kind of non, um, they're, they're not exactly, um, so we, we have the Jones Act, for instance. So these are not direct subsidies. They're not direct payments to the shipbuilding industry. They're kind of informal ways of ensuring that we have a domestic industry. Um, Jones Act is, is great. It's critical. Unfortunately, since we don't domestically and directly subsidize our shipbuilding industry, uh, what, what happens is the Chinese come in at a much lower cost and they take most of the world's international maritime trade. And that, that just continues to put the U.S. industry farther and farther uh, in a hole. And the, if you look at a, a graph of where the number of ships under U.S. flag and the number of ships built in the United States over the last 40 years, it declines year over year over year. Uh, and and you know, that's not just an economic problem. That's a national security problem. And it manifests itself not just in, in the merchant marine, but in things like icebreakers, specialized capabilities that require a really diverse and vital shipbuilding and ship repair industrial base. Um, and um, unfortunately, this has real national and strategic uh, security implications. Wow. So when ships aren't being built in the U.S., you're saying what's happening is like if China's building the ships, then the ships also end up staying owned by China and flying the Chinese flag. Like it's not like American companies are then buying those Chinese ships and other American ships, right? Yeah. So what I'm saying is the Chinese state-owned shipbuilding enterprises are going and they're building ships massively subsidized. They're either flying the Chinese flag and they have a significant merchant marine, or they're being... uh, the Chinese built ships are flying Panamanian or Liberian or Maltese flags. And so either way you cut it, you end up with a significant Chinese uh, you know, shipbuilding presence around the world. Um, and so that, that's the concern that I, I really have is you know, there through a variety of domestic policies, they've been able to, to gain a significant advantage in that market. Uh, and unfortunately, we don't. We, we, we have through a variety of, of domestic policy decisions in the United States, we've gone in the other direction. And ultimately, what's, what's happened is there are national security implications of those, those decisions. And one of them is in key areas, it could be icebreakers, uh, it could be certain types of, of uh, merchant and cargo ships, it could be things like uh, oilers and, and tankers. Um, we have begun to atrophy in our ability to compete globally in those those fields, and uh, it's a national security uh, it's a national security threat. Essentially, it gives China the power to control access to the seas. Well, it, it it's part of a larger. If if you look at how the Chinese view Alfred Thayer Mahan, the the naval theorist, they and you look at the writings of senior PLAN. Uh, admirals, and you look at, at you know, science of strategy and different things that are, are I think, credible academic and, and uh, practical writings in China, they very much view trade as following the flag the way that 19th century European and American naval scholars viewed it. And th- there's very much a uh, holistic approach to having a global navy having a global merchant marine, 
having bases around the world to sustain both trade and a naval presence. Um, and, and in some ways, what you've seen with the Chinese uh, industrial policy, uh, naval policy, uh, their approach to the merchant marine, their approach to overseas basing, their approach to expansion in places like Antarctica, the Arctic, the deep sea. You look at this uh, holistically, this, this is uh, almost like you're looking at how Western Europeans and the United States were approaching the world in the late 19th century. It's, it's really, uh, to me, it's really kind of a fascinating back to the future sort of, uh, sort of approach. Um, and we, we've got to get our heads around the fact that the Chinese are, are thinking of, of, they're looking at the world from a perspective that we no longer have. You know, that to them, industrial policy is not a dirty word. Um, they, they speak, as you guys know well, they speak about these things in terms of spheres of influence and in terms of, of uh, control of resources. And it's a very uh, kind of pseudo Bismarckian approach to the world. Um, and we've got to understand that when we're making national level policy decisions. Well, it seems like over the years, the U.S. has become aware of this kind of uh, uh, thinking in the Chinese Communist Party in uh, the South China Sea or even the Arctic. Uh, why is that not being recognized in Antarctica? Well, I, I said this earlier. I think Antarctica, because it's far away. But the Arctic is far away, too, in a sense. I mean, I guess technically the U.S. Alaska. borders it. Yeah. yeah. So is that the difference between the Arctic and Antarctica? I think I think it's two things. One, because of the way the sea ice has melted in Antarctica, in, in the Arctic, it has generated more publicity for what's going on in the far north. Um, and if you look at the latest IPCC report, it talks about the melting of, of sea ice in the Arctic versus the Antarctic. And the Antarctic is much less likely to see those massive changes to its pack ice the way it is in the Arctic. So I think that's, in terms of getting public attention, that's a, a big part of it. Um, if you look at the Arctic, because Russia is probably the predominant challenger to American supremacy in the Arctic, um, I, I think that's also another reason why a lot of attention has been focused on the far north. Um, mul it, you know, it's multipolarity. It's multiple strategic competitors focused on the same area. Um, and the other thing is the, the uh, Arctic borders Alaska, and you've got uh, two U.S. senators and a congressman who are very focused on it and who um, are able to raise attention in Washington to the challenge in the Arctic. Remember, the icebreakers are primarily, from a U.S. policy standpoint, the icebreakers are primarily focused on the Arctic. The Antarctic is just kind of an ancillary benefit of, of this. Um, so, you know, I, I think for U.S. domestic political reasons, for geopolitical reasons related to Russia, for climate change reasons, I think you end up in a position where the Arctic is just something that gets a lot more attention. And Antarctica, uh, you know, kind of gets short shrift. See, I have an idea. What we should do is America should take over the Falkland Islands. That'll work out really well. And then we make it a state. And then we have senators and a congressman. And and they're now America is a near Antarctic state. Or no, the no. South Island of New Zealand. Matt, Matt, that that that's totally stupid. This is a serious conversation. Clearly, what I'm getting from you is we need to double down on global warming so Antarctica starts to melt as well, and then China can't have a base there. Sure, why don't we just buy Greenland? That's the so I, I heard someone propose that. That was an idea. Someone very popular and well loved. <laughs> yeah. So. So, you know, the, the interesting thing about if you if you think about, you know, the, the Arctic versus the Antarctic, the challenge in the Arctic is it's a it's a more immediate challenge. We can visualize the Russian submarine going to the bottom of the of the of the Arctic uh, Sea and planting the Russian flag. Right. That that's something that, um, you know, Americans and policymakers can really uh, internalize. The Arctic's a little more inchoate, it, it, the Antarctic. It's, it's, you know, we know that the Chinese are there. We know there are five bases. We know that there's, there's some stuff going on that raises some red flags and some concerns. 
but it's much harder to get traction and to, to light a fire under people in Washington, no pun intended, um, just because it, it doesn't exactly, it doesn't exactly um, strike us as a, a day-to-day challenge. But my, my point to you is I think that if we don't act now, it is going to be a front burner day-to-day challenge. And that's why we have to make the investments today so we don't end up like the South China Sea five years from now. I mean, I think, is there is there some kind of complacency too in the Antarctic? Because, you know, like you said, we avoided any kind of militarization during the Cold War. Is there a sense that like, oh, well, that's over, like now it's just scientific and everybody's abiding by these treaties? Well, you have that. I think the treaty breeds complacency because there is no treaty in the Arctic. Um, in the Antarctic, you've had a treaty since the 50s that says you can't militarize, you can't do economic activity. It largely worked. It's often, if you go to these international law conferences, people hold it up as the great example of multilateralism and, and you know, com- uh, global commons and, and how we can, uh, we can come up with these international regimes that actually succeed. Because of that sense of, of kind of patting ourselves on the back, we, we really have just kind of put it out of sight, out of mind. And this is like, to me, this is like space. This is like cyberspace. This is like the Caribbean. This is like um, South Atlantic. This is like the Pacific Islands. This is like the deep seabed. So many places where the Chinese see kind of a, a vacuum. They see the West uh, without you know, having kind of let their guard down. And they move into the seams in between these, these areas of, of focus. And um, next thing you know, you have a crisis on your hands because we, we have become complacent and we have taken our advantages for granted. China is definitely going to be doing the same playbook on Mars. I swear it will be the same thing. <laughs> so so are, are we doing, is America doing like um, drone flybys, like the kind of drones we use in the Middle East? To, Can you do to drones obs- to in Antarctica? the Chinese research stations? I'll, I'll, I'll tell you one one thing that I learned from my, my time in government, there is almost nothing harder in the United States government than getting an unmanned aerial vehicle to do anything. That's more difficult than getting Congress to do something? <laughs> <laughs> but I, but I, thought, I thought Obama like sent tons of drones across the Middle East. So, so this is, that's my point, that there are limited assets and everyone in Washington from the president on down wants to use the limited assets for whatever they think the most important thing is. And, you know, look at Afghanistan. You're going to have most of our UAS capability probably focused on Afghanistan for the foreseeable future. You know, the the limited capability that's focused, unfortunately limited, should be more, that's focused on the Indo-Pacific, focuses on things that you can guess. Um, What we, you know, theaters like Antarctica or even the Arctic or uh, the South Atlantic or the Caribbean have to fight tooth and nail for capabilities. And then Antarctica has the the uh, unique, I mentioned a little bit about the State Department and how at the State Department, it gets thrown into the scientific bureau instead of being something that's focused on by the regional bureaus who have all the clout. You know, you look organizationally, the way that the US government expresses its interest in something is often based on how the bureaucracy is organized to address that issue. And so at the National Security Council, for instance, where I worked, the Antarctic ended up being uh, largely handled by a a brilliant Coast Guard officer, but he was put in the same bureau, uh, the same directorate as the directorate that was doing border control and, um, you know, handling, uh, you know, all sorts of of totally issues where Antarctica and the Arctic didn't really fit in. So... There's an organizational challenge. The Pentagon's another example. Combatant commands, COCOMs. The COCOMs are not really set up um, to cover Antarctica. You know, does it does it really fit in the Pacific Command, or does it fit in, in Africom, or does it fit in, in Southcom? It's not really clear. So when you're talking about allocating assets to deal with something like China and Antarctica, uh, you, you organizationally we're not really set up to have a lot of success there at the moment. 